So we color coded ourselves up there so you could tell us apart. That's Dick, that's Jill. And we gave you, this by the way was made just a few hours ago, daylight, but we use flash all the same. And uh, I can't focus this uh, projector all that sharply, but it's sharp. And uh, if we're a little sharper up there on the window, I can see it's, it was raining. So we're trying to smile in the rain. And uh, I use what will be demonstrating later, Botox, to very quickly bring this picture up and throw a business card on top of it and blend the edges and do a little El Cheapo tricks. Uh, we might go back and look at how I did it, but it's not in the slideshow because when I put the slideshow together, the picture didn't exist. I thought it was more fun than There's the usual portraits. Microphone over there. Uh, can here. people hear me in the back? Yeah. No. Yeah. No? <laughs> okay. Uh, it's recording onto this thing so I can uh, uh, merge audio in with the video. Is, is it audio is okay for that? What's that? Are you, is it coming through okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, you're going to get a chance to get some books raffled off. We're raffling off these cards, <laughs> and everyone's a winner. In fact, if you know five other people that want to grab some, they're at both ends, they're up here, and they're not for our company, they're for the user group out in Natick, which is new. I'll tell you more about it later. And in fact, we're going to start some running around the room so you don't have to get up and do anything. Mm -hmm. That's it. Grab one, send them on. Oh, Text yeah. one in you, let me know if you need more. Because uh, we're doing something a little like this out in Natick. Uh, yeah, right. What sort of user group in there? What? What sort of a user group? <laughs> it's a, well, the card is coming around. It's officially the FOSS. Uh, never mind, I'm going to tell you in the show, so let me hold that one and get on to other good things. So instead of doing a fancy PowerPoint or impress presentation. Uh, I'm just putting up some slides and I'm going to rip through the first part of them with discussion and then I'm going to rip into the second part of them with Photox and actually take that slide and improve it one by one through the slides for show and tell on our favorite current free program. Uh, and uh, I'm going to break this into three parts tonight. The first part is history. It'll be our history, but we've been in some interesting places that you've been in too, some of you. So I think it'll be your history and you can board here when you get to the right places. Um, but some of the stuff we've done. And the second part will be leaning into one program, talking about what we've done all along, trying to make technology directly useful for people who aren't the technological people. Just making it easy to use, comfortable, exploring what that might mean, and not trying to get fancy as much as get to the meat of it easily and effectively. Uh, so we are Miller Microcomputer Services and we're in Natick Mass and uh, I'm Dick, that's not me, you probably thought it was, uh, but uh, that's uh, Adam Beam and he's looking at Surveyor 3 which he a long trip to go look at. Only two years later, I mentioned that because Surveyor 3 went up to see if, like the two ahead of it, if the moon was made of green cheese or there was something that would hold up a craft that landed on it to decide where to land safely. And uh, there's Endeavor on the horizon. He's landed, he's walked over, and he's visiting it. Uh, think back to the last time we did something like that on the moon. So these were exciting days, and I was in aerospace. And one of my gadgets, it's right in there. Uh, there's a little drill, uh, your average miniaturized, ruggedized uh, oil drill, and it's going to drill a hole into the moon, into the green cheese. And the stuff that I was working on is one of the world's smaller and, again, most rugged scanning spectrophotometers, which can go down into the borehole and look at tiny amounts of photons coming out from the sides of the hole down in and analyze what the materials are. This is how you do oil drilling. A company named Schlumberger, Netherlands, makes a hell of a lot of money because no one drills an oil well without hiring them to drop their stuff down the hole and make the measurements and tell them how they're doing. Do we go further or do we start a new hole? Uh, they won't sell their equipment, smart people. So we made a small one to go into the moon. So that's a picture of me, it just didn't look like it. And uh, I was into a lot of interesting projects. That one I thought was by far the best slide of the bunch. Uh, 
So there we are. Jill, I'll say a little more about me, and then I'll go on. My background is engineering and electro-optical physics. And if any of you know the engineers' jokes about the physicists, or the physicist jokes about the engineers, you know they're all right. And, uh, <laughs> but I've got both of them, so I'm either better or I can joke at myself from both sides. Uh, and uh, I did some other work on laser eye surgery, back when we were only doing it on rabbits because it wasn't ready yet. And uh, I just got a new lens in my eye this past summer, so it's kind of closing a circle for me in a way. Uh, and I've worked on automatic celestial navigation systems. That's how come uh, uh, the U-2 could fly up and get shot down over Russia with only a pilot, no navigator. And they would have been in all the commercial flights, but the uh, Pilots and Navigators Union didn't like that idea. Um, and uh, uh, I have a different caption for the picture I just showed you. I said, I've got my own garbage on the moon. I think that's a nice statement, because I'm also an environmentalist. And uh, I've been executive director of the Lake Cochituate Watershed Association. That's in three towns, including our Natick out in Metro West. And Lake Cochituate is the largest recreational lake in eastern Massachusetts. It's the major one that people actually visit compared to its nicety and its size, its distance from people. Uh, so we know all the state agency people and stuff like that and fight to keep it clean. This is a continuous battle. Uh, and I'm currently a member of the Massachusetts Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board, which is a little related to that. So uh, that's kind of me. And you know I like computers. And I like doing things with computers that make them better at what you want, not better at being a computer, but better for solving a problem you care about. We do it for clients. We do it for ourselves. And I'll be doing it tonight for your, your dinky pocket digital camera to make it look really confident. The same trick. How do you make the computer better? How do you make the camera better? How do you make you better? A few of the programs really tickle us for that reason. Now we're up to Jill. That's not Jill either, but uh, it's close enough from back then. And uh, Jill uh, majored in botany in college and then did computer programming, systems programming. And uh, that's a particularly good picture for Jill because Jill put in part of the team that put in the first IBM 360 in New England. So uh, she was right there. In fact, she'd already been working on when did that happen? 1140s? No, 1401. That's <laughs> close. 1401, some hot stuff like that. So this is what we called computers back when we were suddenly confronted with little ones you could take home and could afford to take home. Um, this is Jill's background of what a computer is, what it does, and who it's going to do it for. You can see where we came to make a bit of a 180 on that. Uh, and she uh, worked at a number of companies and did a bunch of consulting. But at Liberty Mutual, uh, she was the first female systems programmer because people knew women couldn't do that sort of stuff. But she was there and told them different. And she was also the first woman there and in any department to have men working under her because they knew women couldn't do that either. So Jill's been a pioneer in some other things. And I mentioned uh, we're talking about a universal African language. And I mentioned uh, we deal in the universal universal language, Esperanto. Jill is fluent in Esperanto. And I like it, but I'm not fluent in it. I can most of the way read my way through it. And uh, people will come from around the world and telephone and say saluton, and I'll hand the phone over to Jill. And they're in the Boston area. They want to know what's good to do. Is there an Esperanto meeting? They, it's just like computer stuff, but it's a pen pal group worldwide. And that's some of Jill. So uh, just wanted to introduce us with something from back when. Uh, and now we're getting into uh, our company because of, oops, hello. Apparently you have to press the right button. Anyone remember that? This is real computers we're talking about now. Trash a 80. computer you can take home with you, a Trash 80, a TRS-80 Model 1. Yeah. And uh, if you look real close, you'll see it's got the nice, curved, dinky television set screen. It's got the big, fat keyboard with nothing in it. It's just this. But you could get it with the whole computer in the keyboard. But this one, under the screen, has an expansion interface extra money. This means you can expand it 
you can expand this one from 16K to 64K, guys. You can put 64K in this computer. And, uh, well, you can't really, because 16K is that's going to be for graphics. But you can have the rest of it, 48K for you. And uh, you can now plug it into everything else, except this connector here on the inside it's just the edge of a printed circuit board, give you 15 and seconds. Radio Shack, in its wisdom, knew that it could economize getting gold plate contacts. And many of us learned how to silver solder the contacts just so they wouldn't oxidize and ruin the connection. Early stuff, but it was big news because you didn't have to build it, except for the silver soldering. And, uh, the price was good because we've been out there pricing a small computer for one of the environmental jobs we were working on, and we thought we'd have to go out and uh, work at 4 a.m. with volunteers on someone's timeshare computer to get a job done with funding attached and good ways to get ahead in the environmental activities and grow the organization. Uh, well, a friend of mine said, you're going to spend that much? For computer time, do you realize you could go home with a computer for that price and just do it at home when you want to? Excuse me. I'll I said, you got to be kidding. And Jill and I went out and found that one. her great big drives were now something the size of a book. The big book, Can but a book. And uh, we got interested. And then we went to the first computer show in Boston at BU. Anyone went there way back when? And uh, Radio Shack showed up by accident the day before they'd gone down mm -hmm. Wall Street in New York City. To the steps of the New York Stock Exchange to announce the new TRS-80. And uh, all the reporters gathered, and just as they were about to step up, open the box and show what they had, the last reporter came around the corner and said, hey, a bomb went off two blocks away. All the reporters disappeared instantly. And these two guys from Fort Worth, Texas, looked at each other and said, what do we do now? The other one said, well, I hear there's something called a computer show that's opening this weekend in Boston. Maybe we can get a table. Uh, so we got to meet TRS-80s instantly at the very beginning by accident. And we got to meet the chief engineer on the project. And we just got a wonderful in on the whole thing. We're, but we couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe it because it was obviously too good to be true. It was too much for the money. And it didn't look reassuring. And... Uh, they couldn't deliver any. Real soon now. We came back the next day and so did a friend of ours that we now do a lot of things with, although he's now in the south of France. And uh, we both ordered them the next day. And pretty soon our friends started getting theirs, and we weren't getting ours. We called up and it turned out they were having trouble delivering the 48K ones. They could deliver the 16K ones just fine. And I said, look, we paid you the extra money. We want to get started. And there's no difference in cost between the 48K one and upgrading the 16K one to 48K. So what do you say you get us the 16K one for now and let us get started and let us do the upgrade instead of having us stuck because we gave you all the money up front? And he bounced me for that chief engineer that we met in Boston. He said, don't do that, Dick. You'll have one in two days. And sure enough, my local Radio Shack store called me in two days and said, I've got a computer for you. And we came home with it. And we just about opened the box when the same guy called me back and said, Dick, I don't understand. I've got a computer for you. I said, yeah, we just picked it up. He said, no, no, this is another one that just came. I said, you sure? He said, yeah. He said, I, I know I can sell it, but if you want it, you get two instead of waiting. And no, that was the next morning, because we've been up all night. We've been up until like <laughs> 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> <four hours. laughs> next morning. I so by then, what we knew was what it was dinky, but by God, it worked. It hadn't failed, and it looked capable of doing some real things. Well, this year, you wouldn't say that, but that year, we did say that. And we said, you could really program on this. And so I said, yeah, we'll take the other. Damned if I know why, but we'll take the other. And I think that was about Wednesday, the second day it happened. And that Friday night, we invited a bunch of our computer friends over. And when I say computer friends, I'm referring to the MIT AI group that came over. We had a coffee table with stereo TRS-80s on it, one at each end of the coffee table. And they made a little semicircle around each end of the table, and no one wanted to go home. And we just kept 
serving a couple of things, and by the end of the evening, we had a fistful of really interesting, weird programs that no one had ever thought of before running on our computer. Now, by running on it, I mean on a 16K maximum Philips tape cassette that you loaded in carefully so it could possibly not make load errors. Otherwise, you loaded the whole damn thing again. Uh, and uh, so we had a lot of these little 16K programs. We had no drive that would hold anything. So that's where we began. And we began knowing you could do things on it, but not yet, because we were waiting for hard drives. We were waiting for better programs. We were waiting for diskette drives. Uh, that's right. We were waiting for disk drives, never mind the <laughs> big stuff. And uh, we were also waiting for better tools to do the programming, because the tiny basic was lovely, but far too simple. And the advanced basic, so to speak, uh, was pretty crippled. Uh, we knew what we wanted was Pascal. And it was forever not coming. And while it was not coming, we saw two things. One was a notice that Fourth Inc. was coming to Boston with a sales seminar. And we could sit in on it and see how wonderful Fourth was. Yeah, sure, Fourth, who cares? Uh, but we went. And I saw the most stunning boost in my awareness of what you could do on a computer that I've ever seen before or since. It was just an acceleration of what I thought you could do. It was immense. And I checked it out, and the more I kicked the tires, the more I looked at it, <coughs> the more I thought it would go on a TRS-82. But they didn't want to put it on a TRS-80, and they weren't about to give it away if they couldn't sell it. And if they could have sold it and wanted to sell it on a TRS-80, it would have cost $3,000 for one TRS-80. Not where we were going. <coughs> well, the TRS-80 wasn't much cheaper. Uh, with two floppy drives, that's a floppy drive, that's another. The two floppy drives and the expansion interface, nothing else. 2650. That was a bargain. That was about 2,000 less than it ought to be at that time when we were looking. That's why we bought. And uh, that's the minimum we thought we'd need for any serious business work. A printer was another matter. Printers took one strong or two average people to lift, and uh, they were big, and they went for $26.50 for the printer, and it was bulky. The print head looked about like what I call a small printer these days, and uh, it uh, could handle this dot matrix, of course. It could handle seven vertical dots in a sweep. If you wanted descenders, you drew them in yourself. The Ys flew high. Uh, up on the line, lowercase y's, because it had no descenders. So this was crude stuff, but it's where we began. And the second thing we discovered was there's just no way Fourth Inc. was going to take the trip. But they didn't own Fourth. They owned Fourth Inc.'s Fourth. We got introduced to open source. And uh, there were other Fourths out there, but for this new TRS-80, the want nothing until one thing showed up in a little ad and we bought a copy for $10. We got a cassette tape, again, 16K worth of cassette tape, loaded in, and it ran forth. And by then I knew what forth meant and I knew I cared, but it was terrible. And there's no way you could teach it to someone that didn't already know it was about it because it had no internal or external support. So <laughs> I knew we wanted to get there. I couldn't get there. I forgot about Pascal. And we started asking around. We'd also started. Uh, the first TRS-80 user group in the world. That was TrueGem, the TRS-80 user group of Eastern Massachusetts. And uh, in that group, one of the co-founders, there were three, um, said, well, I've got a friend at work who's been borrowing a friend's TRS-80 at lunchtime. So he can put his fourth onto TRS-80. Uh, oh my god, I said, let's, we gave him a TRS-80. He could now take it home and do it. And he became a member of our new Miller Microcomputer Services, which up till then had been doing minimal things with TRS-80s. And we got fourth on it. And some of you already know our rather big, rather healthy fourth, MMS fourth for Miller Microcomputer Services. And we were a big fish in a little pond all over the world. We had our own user groups in Australia, Japan, 
more locally, etc. So fourth dragged us out in, and fuss drew us into fourth. We made money on it. We sold it for 180 bucks, and you could put it on multiple computers, but it was yours, not someone else's. And then we had other modules you could add on. We started adding everything one by one, word processors, uh, number handling, databases, and uh, we did something. Uh, you skip the slide, I think. Oh, sure, let's, let's go on. Sorry, I have too much fun on the TRS-80 slide. And, uh, nom, nom, nom. Come on, are you there? So yeah. that's, the, that's the book you got for $180. Luckily, there was stuff inside it, too. <laughs> <laughs> and good support from us. And we had a monthly meeting uh, around Boston for that. And I put in the, uh, I wish that, that was sharper, but uh, this is the way fourth source code looks. And uh, it's plain text. It's in blocks. Those are called blocks, and they're numbered block 218 at the bottom. And 16 lines of 64 characters is a good fit on the TRS-80 <coughs> screen. The Apple parsed it a little differently, but they did the same thing. And it's neatly indented or not. And uh, you can cram it tight or not. You can comment it extensively or not. People who don't know fourth like to call it a write-only language. <laughs> uh, but in fact, it's very readable once you know the tricks. And there's two main tricks. Uh, looking at line two on block 218, the bottom block here. Uh, I've got a toy for this for a minute. Um, colon, MF disk. And a lot of stuff goes on. And at the end of it, there's a semicolon. Colon starts building a new word in a fourth vocabulary. And just like your human vocabulary, you can't create a word except in words you already know. So very similarly, you start with a base set of fourth words, and you build words onto it. And the last word you add in is probably the name of the program, and it's just a word too. You didn't write a program. You extended a vocabulary, and in the process got a program. Meanwhile, you got all those other words for using everywhere else you're doing business. And the second way you can write a fourth word, that's colon, semicolon, and the name is the first thing, and then from out there on is the code, in line. But up at the top, we're doing something different. Two word, uh, wait a minute. Line through two, again. On the top? Yeah. Oh, I've got it. I, I'm not seeing it well from here, right. Uh, it says code, you see the very first item? It's creating a word, but it's writing it in code. And very simply, we are up there writing in-line assembler. And the assembler was written in fourth, by the way. Of course it was. Everything's written in fourth if you're writing in fourth. In fact, you write a fourth program to write the fourth program, the fourth itself, using a meta compiler. You can aim it from one machine to the machine it's going to land on, create it, and then just slap it on and let it run. So everything in fourth is written in fourth. The assembler was written in fourth, and here we're using it, inline assembler, and it's RPN, like your old HP calculator. Put a number up, put a number up, then add them, et cetera, et cetera. It roughly can be considered Lisp uh, for somebody that likes HP calculators. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. It, it's yeah, that's not the vocabulary, bad. Yeah. and different functions take different numbers of arguments and know what to do them with duct typing. It will do anything you want that you and the hardware can do. And it's also notable that it's built up in words, and those words can easily be built up, again, in any language you want. So it was very popular overseas, where English programming was not as established as it is this year. And you could just rebuild it fast in your language and be up and rolling. And any time I had a new tool for doing something with new hardware I was running, whatever, I had it for all my other jobs, it was there. Very, very flexible, wonderful language, and a language in which people built COBOL, built Fortran, built Pascal in fourth. You got everything for the same price once you knew how to do it. So for us, it was wonderful. The real punchline is it made a small, slow computer look larger and faster. Anytime the fourth wasn't running fast enough, the assembler in the innermost loop would make it run fast enough. You just go find out where the time was going on the routine and recode that line in assembler just that easily, right in line. 
bang. By the way, you can put assembler in the middle of an upper high level fourth definition too. There's no holds barred. This is an incredible game. But you can also just as easily redefine four to equal two. You've got to be very careful who gets their hands on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, uh, that's fourth. I think it's important mentioning that because we spent many, many years very happy in fourth. And I told you, uh, by the way, those three blocks I just showed you were our uh, disk repartitioning routine for grabbing an IBM XT uh, hard drive that finally arrives. And uh, those three blocks, three K source code and a tiny amount of compiled code, uh, were what it took to grab our partitions off of it and use them for us, including all the prompts on the screen, the whole bit. So very compact, very powerful. And speaking of hard drives, this is the first one that came home. Uh, it's from Corvus, and up near the top there, um, for TRS-80, well, it was for Apple II, and they came to us and they said, hey, you guys seem to know how to do sneaky things inside TRS-80s. Uh, how would you like to uh, write the driver, and you'll get royalties, and two of these guys, these guys are about twice the volume of a shoebox, uh, and the top is black plastic that's smoky. You can almost see what's going on inside. And it was very exciting at the time to see what was going on inside on a big platter. And uh, um, it was phenomenal. We were dealing with 195K on our extra compressed method we had for reformatted floppies on both sides. And I don't think anyone else was getting them more than about 180K. And uh, suddenly, here was something that was 10 count of 10 megabytes. And for only just a little over $5,000. <laughs> and this didn't weigh that much, but its power supply was maybe the size of the shoe box I was mentioning. And it easily weighed four times what this weighed. It was phenomenally heavy. Uh, and it needed that power supply to make it run. And it did its thing. And 10 megabytes for people that were living on two drives of 195K each was phenomenal. I think some of you remember what a jump that was. So we did that one too, and we did it because our fourth could go in and do things like that. Our lead programmer was Tom Dowling, and Tom Dowling could do a job like that. I think it probably took him two real full days of work to do the whole thing, just including the debugging. It's always including the, you know, one quarter of that time, except for the debugging. Uh, so that's a little clue as to some of where we went with it. I mentioned we're interested in environmental stuff, and we got to take our computers aboard your average uh, three-masted barkentine, and uh, it's uh, square rigged. It's 140 feet waterline length. It's the Regina Maris, sailed out of Boston once upon a time, and then out of Gloucester after that, and no longer sails. And uh, look about 80 feet up on this yard, and you'll see a guy up there. See him? Uh, He's up on that yard, and he could be trimming sails, but he's not. He's got all sails set. You don't set that many sails unless you're going for a week or so on the same tack. They're on their way to Tahiti. And uh, he's up there, and what he's doing instead is doing what the boat does when it's not taking a trip. It's much better than a power boat for loitering in one place out in the ocean and looking at humpbacked whales. And we were helping. God help us with Apple II's, which we didn't like, but we volunteered, and there they were. And uh, they were putting together a first database to photograph the fingerprint of every single humpback whale, which <laughs> specifically marks on the tail fluke when they go flukes, when they go up and over. Every whale has different patterns. So you photograph them, give them a name, put them in a database, and then start relating them by which ones you see together over and over on different sightings and groups in Europe, and groups, and this group here, and a group down in Florida, uh, basically fingerprinted all the whales in the North Atlantic, and now know the family patterns. And I was at a talk about a month ago, asked an expert on the subject, and said, oh yeah, we're still doing exactly the same thing. It's, it's the key to almost all the rest of our research. So we were in the beginning of that because we volunteered to play with computers. And that guy is up there for a different reason. Looking down about 100 feet to the water, you see whales a lot deeper in the water than you do if you're at the deck. 
So this old boat was serving a new purpose admirably. And of course, it made no motor noise while it was loitering in the pod of whales. The motor would affect the, the whales in some way you didn't want for your data. So another really interesting project we've been involved in. And we've met great people in every one of them. So that's kind of a little of the background, some of the great toys we've played with. You see, we like toys, and some of them are big. By the way, we own that boat, partially. About five splinters worth, I calculate, was our share. Mm -hmm. But it was group owned, and you could do things like that. Uh, so uh, I got little trips on it. Jill got a month on it. She, she has stories to tell. Um, and uh, here we are. This is from a few a month ago, I guess, on a different slideshow. So it's uh, not this week's Ubuntu, but it's last week's Ubuntu, week <laughs> before. And uh, this is uh, 11.04. It doesn't look much different now, uh, but this is just a slide from it. And the point is, nowadays, we are playing almost exclusively in Ubuntu Linux. We got forced right out of the fourth business because we like fourth as a total software environment, doing everything in it. The way you survive in fourth this year is you run it on the operating system that the computer comes with. Then you don't have to write drivers for everything in the world. We had to write drivers for everything in the world. And it just swamped us. It got to the point where we wanted to be a small company. And you couldn't be a small company and do all that grunt work. Uh, so uh, we left it. And years later, we said, well, really, a lot of the fascination we had with fourth is there with Linux. Again, we have this community where other people can kick in their stuff and it can get shared back. We don't have to charge a lot for the program because we didn't write most of the program. We're just writing with a lot of other people on our little share of it, our splinters of the boat, if you will. Uh, so we see a lot of the same reasons that we've enjoyed Linux and free open source software. Uh, but we also have to earn a living, and we get paid for the consulting, and we're just consulting with something we can offer people for less money it's better. So everyone's a winner. Uh, and by the way, that's not that different from the way IBM sees it. And they're a somewhat different size than we are. So it plays to a lot of different scales. And that's our argument for why we got suckered into it. And uh, there's a few people here, Jerry in particular, who can tell you that we didn't come in all that smoothly. We're demanding. We've got clients that think they're going to have a smooth trip because we got them a smooth trip. They didn't pay us for the problems. They paid us for not even the solutions, but having it just not need solutions. Just be smooth, transparent, easy. And Linux was not that way to me. And I knew I was the least demanding of the people that I was representing. I had to worry about our weakest, least interested client. And how did they get good at it? And bit by bit, we got better. We learned some tools for getting around the rough edges. There were plenty of them. I remember when I didn't dare show it to someone because the lettering on the screen looked that crude. It wasn't what was important to a programmer, but there was no way I was going to get some business person to trade down to that grade of ugly screen. And now it's beautiful, and now it's smooth, smooth as others, and um, it's got a lot of extra things to offer because we can afford to try 100 things where our wallet would let us try 10 to 20 things before. They're free. I can try them. And I can pick a few I want to get really good at. And that works. So we love the stuff. So it took us a while to get there. And Jerry was very helpful. And so were some other people. And so were people way far away on the internet. And uh, that's the miracle of it. Uh, and we're not just playing with Ubuntu. We're playing with a lot of the stock software. This is Libra, Office, Impress. And putting together slides for a different show I gave a little while ago. And uh, some of our favorite standard stuff showing there. But the point is, we're using a lot of stock tools and teaching other people that it makes sense to use them. And uh, I think these just went around. We've got a new group we helped to start because we know we're not paying for this in money. We have to pay for it in something because we want more of it. And one of the things we've done to pay for it is to start a local user group out our way. There's good stuff in Boston. We're at one now. There's fairly good stuff in Worcester, not as good. In between, it's a no man's land. And there's plenty of programmers out there, and even more people that would like to know about this stuff, but they're not programmers. Big gap. So in Natick, which is the home to any number of good software companies, 
we decided to set something up. The library decided this was not an appropriate activity for the library. They said, well, $125 a night, we could rent the room. I said, wait a minute, we're volunteering our time and we're volunteering our skill, but we're not going to pay for the privilege of giving it to you. We thought you might be appreciative. Uh, they said, no, nope, sorry. So the senior center stepped in. The catch is they close at 5. So first Wednesday afternoon, 3 to 5, is us. You can skip work early. You can come out. Uh, if you're in high school in Natick, we're hoping high school students can get there by 3, and they can join us too. And we're still building a crowd. But we'll get a crowd like this one tonight. I know you get much bigger some nights. But we'll get a crowd like this on our good night, and uh, we're growing. And we just started doing these handouts and a little more advertising. We started in March, and we've had good meetings and good talks by other people. And uh, come on out, give us something, or take something, or both. Uh, share. Uh, so that's kind of what we're about. Now, if you don't have the card with you, just FOSS user group in native. Just do a search and you'll find it fast. Or we are at millermicro.com. If you go to millermicro.com, up on the second screen or so as you scroll down the first page, you'll find our Linux items. And we have two categories of main Linux items. One of them is basically sales pitches. What's good about Linux? And the second part is Linux resources. You're interested in Linux and now what can you get to help you get along? Uh, and we pick some of our favorites just from everything that's out there to give people a good start on that. So I'll mention both of those quickly. And uh, I finished the first of the three parts of my program, the history and how we got to where we are today. And you sort of know what we want. We want stuff that's so damn nice, you want to use it. And there's a lot of it out there, but how do you find the right stuff? And if you're not a <laughs> programmer, if you're not crafty on a keyboard, how do you get up to speed on it gracefully and easily? We'll sell it. We have a once a month place to give it away. And there's a ton of online stuff we can lead you to anytime without even talking to us. So I wanted to pick one of those for tonight, one that we also give back to, because we think it's so nice. About a year ago, uh, I discovered Photox. Um, uh, Photox for photos. You said Photox has one X, this has two Xs at the end. And again, you can just go online and type in Botox, F-O-T-O-X-X, and you'll find it fast enough. Uh, it's not that popular, it's not that well known. I think it should be. And if you're using Ubuntu, you could go to the Ubuntu Software Center and get a copy. Do not do that. It's about a year obsolete. It's a real bad mistake to get that one. Uh, so instead, you go up, you just type in Botox and you'll get to there, foursquare.com. You don't have to write it down, just say Botox and you'll find it. And this is the opening screen for it, and it's a great overview. It goes down, you can scroll way down, learn a lot about how good it is. But if you want it, you go over to the right side, and you scroll down that, almost to the bottom, <laughs> and one of those entries on the right will be called Packages. <coughs> and what you want is a package for your Linux. It's right under Downloads, if I remember. Okay, it doesn't matter. It's down near the bottom there. I've got Miller Micro up right now. No, we're looking at Photog. At Photog. Uh, so way down at the bottom, you'll find packages. And there's a note there for Ubuntu users that works fine with the Debian packages. And go down in the Debian packages. There's RPM packages, stuff for other uses. And look down at the Photox. It's not the only thing he does. And uh, in there under Photox, you'll get a 64-bit and a 32-bit option. Download the one you want. For my netbook, it's 32-bit. My desktop is 64. I just download it onto the desktop. Then I right click on the icon on the desktop and it just comes right up and uses Ubuntu Software Center to install it easy as pie. Really nice. Then you've got to somehow attach it to all your photos. That's your problem because you know where your photos are and it does not yet. Uh, and it'll ask you to synchronize them to open. And that can take quite a while if you have a lot of photos, and I do. Um, uh, but it'll just do an incremental synchronize from there on. It'll be nice. Now, I'm demonstrating next month's version. I don't do the programming on it, but I do quite a bit of the feedback on it these days and suggestions. So I'm going to take you for the second part of my talk. The third part is going to be everything else. It's questions and anything else that wants to go on. And I'm going to take you into Photox and show you and make some comments because I think it's significantly different from the other programs I've bumped into uh, particularly 
Photoshop, which is powerful, expensive, and a pain in the butt, and uh, very complicated. And uh, it's imitation for open source to GIMP, which I think is very complex, uh, hard to follow, <coughs> and uh, just, uh, what do you see? See if you agree. Now, I also know of a lot of simpler programs. I started using independent ones with Windows a long time ago. And uh, I did because they were cheap, maybe $40 meant cheap. And uh, they were simpler and more direct and available. I haven't found anyone I've ever used or the people told me about who know about this uh, that they don't like this better. But uh, it's quite powerful. It's surprisingly nimble. I'm playing on a stock uh, Atom 470 uh, triple E PC, uh, one to two years old, I guess now. And uh, it's not the most, it's not the least. I like Asus a lot, I like triple E PCs, but they're not astonishing in terms of any power. And if you want a question and answer, I'll tell you why I think they're so great, but it's not because they're powerful. I do have one souped up PC in it, and only one. Well, two, it's been up from one gigabyte of RAM to two. That's easy to do and cheap. Uh, doesn't help that much, it's not a big deal. And it also has, instead of a 250 gig hard drive, 500 within the hard drive, a secret built-in four gigabytes of solid state with an algorithm in the hard drive that knows how to cache the latest things that fit that I've been using a lot to get some things back real fast without needing a slot for any extra item, without needing your operating system to know about it and how to handle it. This is nice, this is, this is cool. This is 90 bucks, this is interesting. So that's the How only thing that I've called souped up in it. How long have you been using it? I've been using it for most of a year, not quite. Maybe Thanksgiving, maybe Christmas, somewhere back in that area. What's the make and model on this hybrid drive? Uh, catch me afterward for that, okay? I'll be happy to go back on those things, but I want to get through this. That, and then that'd go be good it. to send to the mailing one. Yeah. Um, I can, I can throw the details in my sign-off on every e email if I want. It's down there and quite I erase for most emails. Uh, so, um, so this is Photox. Photox is written by one main programmer, and he must do at least 90% of the programming, and though he gets contributions. And of course, he gets uh, lots of things that are out there from other open source. He doesn't have to invent everything to use it. Uh, and he's a very good programmer who's retired. He's American, but he married a German wife and he's retired to Germany. So I chat with him a few times a day in Germany via email. And yesterday I downloaded two new draft versions of it. It typically comes out on the first of every month with a new release version. So it's also version 11.10 right now for you when you download I'm running 11.11 .11 draft, and it's been pretty drafty with making changes, and I think it's stable for everything I'm doing tonight. And I'll say the same thing about the Ubuntu 11.10, which I'm running. That was pretty drafty until very recently, but it's been stable for me for, oh, Three maybe, days. maybe <laughs> well, two anyway. <laughs> so it's, it's settling down and flying right. It's missing some pieces, but what it's got is pretty nice, I think. That's only uh, six days old right now for its release. Uh, and it's almost ready for release, you may quote me. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and so what's new, right? And I'm not telling my clients to run and take it yet. I, I want to be on it smooth for a month before I tell them to come and get it. Uh, so here we are uh, in uh, a view of that Photox screen, but we're not in Photox, we're in a slideshow looking at my slides. So now what I'm going to do Oh, I, I, can't, I can't even there. see it. Ah. No, you have to have 11 first. I do. This is a problem with matching this projector here. My, my computer is now forced to run 800 by 600, so I'm not seeing what I'm used to seeing at 1024 by 600. And oh. we're, all, we're all arguing and working it out as we go. Excuse me, I left Photox open there. Oh. In the back. Uh, oh, how nice of you. Is it showing all the way? Yeah. Well, almost. Well, it's fine. Bar covering away. Something's, something's freaky up there because that shouldn't be any further to the left than the Photox title, but it is. 
No, it's just that you. Anyway, got your okay, we've got Photox. Photox is small so and unless there isn't auto folding on the small screen. No, that's not what's going on. I'm I'm simply yeah. windowing out on both sides, big black bars, uh, and it's because I'm forced to four by three yeah. mode. And I have a routine to correct that that works fine on every digital projector I've tried it on until tonight. And you knew that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, this is after they upgraded the projector. If anyone's wrestling with projectors and wants to, I'll be happy to share the routine I worked out. And uh, R&R &R is the concept down within, and there's lots of tools for playing with it to adjust and tilt and resize stuff. Uh, and it should be doing mine right and that one right concurrently, and it's not. So we're punting. Uh, in any case, Photox does come up quickly. Uh, you can see it says version 11. And I have to start by opening something. And I had some things that were open. Let's see if I'm really lucky. I'll find one in the set I want to use. Well, let's give up on it instead. And I'll go to the desktop. And this is the slideshow for tonight. And I'll start in the slideshow. And probably want to source them by name. That would make a lot of sense. Somehow I thought they would be. And uh, let's see, Firefox, Photox, I'll bet this is the first one, wouldn't you? And uh, so I'll load a first slide into Photox. I would make this full screen, but I don't dare. That's as close to full screen as I can get. And all the slides I'm showing you tonight were from over 100 that I snapped off real quick with that little digital <coughs> pocket camera. It's good, but it's not great. It's not a, like the, like the netbook, it's good equipment selected to be good, but I didn't pay double for it or anything like that. And it's about two years old. It's a Casio XLM. It's thinner than almost anything else. And it does some things I particularly like. And I'm about to buy a new one, and I'll tell you why when we get to it. Uh, so these were all taken on October 10th, two Mondays ago. Anyone remember? Occupy Boston. We went in for the march, and we took a bunch of pictures of the march, and the parade, and the signs, and the people. And the cool chick doing the interview with the guy who's got a good sign in front of South Station. And uh, so that'll be a good first one to play with. But all, this, all the samples I'm doing tonight happen to come from that two Mondays ago set that I took. I thought it'd be nice to do some, something fresh. And as usual, and as we think up with the computer itself, <coughs> the camera would be a better tool if they had better stuff to work with it. And uh, the photos typically you take a lot of bad photos, and so do I. And uh, some of those bad photos are bad because they're bad. And some of those photos are bad because the good stuff in them isn't presented yet. And those are the ones we're after with the photo editing program. And by the way, I won't show you tonight, but it does a fine job on photo management as well. If you've got 20,000 photos and you need to find the couple you're looking for quickly, it's good at that. Um, but that's not the side of it I'm looking at. Does it handle the like, unlimited layers? What? Uh, what, what? How does the handling of layers look for you? It doesn't do layers. Oh, layers? It doesn't do layers? It's, it's not doing layering per se, but you can pick up all or part of a photograph and bring it across to another photograph. And you can juggle multiple uh, images that way. It works very well, and it's much faster uh, and smaller than the other app. I'm working on a small computer, and I find it's running a lot faster than most of the other ones we're doing. And I'll show you some of that as we go. It's not layering, but uh, remember that business card on the picture of us behind the car at the beginning of the slideshow? You can bring things over and put them in just fine. Uh, you can lay them out in perfect juxtaposition with each other, like layering, or you can uh, just take pieces and play around with them wherever you wish, size them, rotate them into place, etc. You uh, don't have to be photoshopped to do cool things. Right, exactly. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think you'll find it's very competent at all the regular things you're going to do with the photograph. I can do a lot more with Photoshop or with the GIMP beyond what I do with a regular photograph. And I can do some of that with this too, more than with most small, nimble programs. Uh, but it's not as complete as they are in terms of that. On the other hand, it is able to use Photoshop plugins. So it has a lot of power beyond what it is also. So, uh, remember what I said about Forth? 
one way or another, you can cheer me up. Anything else in it? This is using some of those concepts. So it's not written in fourth. It's written in probably C++ to help us. Uh, so anyway. As long as he does it. <laughs> as long as he does it, right. And he's doing it. Uh, so I'm going to take this photo, and I'm going to go through what I call a standard photo manipulation routine. I could program it into a routine that just plays through, but I never do. I always find I want to do something a little different on each one by keeping my eye on it. In this case, certainly uh, the girl and the man are the key to this one, and everything else is distracting from that. So I'm going to zoom in on that, but the first thing I'm going to do every time, I'm not using a tripod with a buckle level, I'm using a handheld camera and snapping, and they're going to be tilted. I don't know how much they're going to be tilted, but I know they're going to be tilted. So let's start by assuming they're tilted. Uh, there's a lot of tools up here. By the way, for those who haven't met the new Ubuntu with the new Unity, uh, it's time to boo or cheer. Um, the uh, top menu line from your live program is up in the top here when you get to it. And until you get to it, something else can be there. And the idea is you're freeing up one more vertical line that you're not taking up with stuff. And I noticed that. And on problem. a netbook, that's good news. And on a big desktop, it's not such good news. And Dick, I noticed a problem here. It's not showing? Well, it, yeah, part of it isn't showing. It goes over to retouch, and art isn't showing. Oh, how cute. Well, I can, start, I can go over to it anyway. But uh, no, actually, that's clip, well, because mine's, because this is narrow, and this is clipping. Uh, Sorry, uh, we can do it, but it's not going to look quite right. Anyway, there's three uh, categories of tools here. I want to particularly emphasize we'll be living in them. Transform, retouch, and... Um, if you get rid of the date time... Let me, let me go over and step through, and then I can get there. Uh, step, step. Yep. Um, oh, come on, what's the name? I can't believe him. Art. Art. Art, artwork, art. Uh, and these are different categories of tools, and of all the different things in here, and there's plenty of them, these are the three you're going to live in for most of your actual editing operation within the photo. And they're, as of yesterday morning, laid out in the order I think is logical, because I start with a transform, but the one I want first is rotate, maybe we'll see that in December. And uh, I want to rotate first because I want to know if I have to rotate. My game is to bring it down to the pixels I want to end up with and then play with those pixels. But first I want to do everything to get the pixels I'm going to end up with. Concept. Uh, so I'll click on Rotate Image. Maybe we'll see it. Maybe we could we see it. And um, grid is checked. And because grid is checked, that grid is showing. Uh, and it'll stay checked until the next session or until I decide to uncheck it on this tool. I can have it on various tools at my option. And this is one of the changes I made, for example. Grid was there way before I found out, but it disappeared. And you could set it to the color you want. You could have it disappear on the whites or disappear on the blacks or disappear on the grays or the greens, but you couldn't see it all the time. And I said, Mike, here's a clue I learned a long time ago. <laughs> Make a one pixel line wide grid line in white. And adjacent to it, make a one pixel wide grid line in black. And only one of them will disappear. And that's what you're looking at here. So I did none of the programming, but I solved the problem. With a thousand people doing stuff like that, it gets good. Um, so that's one example of this mine. And I'm going to look, I always go to look for something that's sort of toward the center, and I know it's either horizontal for real or vertical for real, and then I align to that. And I'm looking at the building behind, and to the right side, I see a beautiful white line. Uh, Use your curve. Up. Yeah. <laughs> Let there be light. And uh, that looks beautiful, but I think it's a banner, and it might be flying in the wind, and I'm not going to touch it. So instead, this looks vertical. This looks vertical. This looks vertical. They're all toward the center. I'll go for one of those. And if I look real close, it's not quite vertical. And I can go by 90 degree, 10 degree, 1 degree, or a tenth of a degree increments. Or when all else fails, I just tap and drag on the actual edge. And this stuff works live. I'm not waiting for lots of calculating to go on. I told you you'd have live stuff 
I think that's pretty good right there. I'm going to stop. I'm going to make believe that's right, and if you don't like it, you could have done it a little differently. And before I leave, look at the black wedges on the edges, because I've taken some of the area, moved the pixels away from some of the rectangle. Uh, so I can do a trim, and I can get my maximum size without my futzing at all. Instant, easy operation. This is a small computer. I'm working with down at the bottom. Uh, oh, this is just small. This has already been cropped down. It's 614 by 456 uh, pixels, and uh, it's 1.88 megabytes. Oh, that's a big difference. It can't be that small and be 1.88 megabytes. What's going on? is I'm at a stage in this where it's showing the small number of pixels but working with the original full set. Every time I do some interpolation, it's going to round off a little bit and lose a little bit in the operation. So it's working with the great big one, and the part I keep is going to be a minuscule change, if any. Uh, so it's working with the big numbers. I'm seeing the small numbers, if you will. And now I'm done with this operation. I haven't left the image, I haven't saved the image, I've just finished the operation. And I'm on to the next. Proof, I can undo. That's where I came from. I can redo and go back to it. This is how I like to work with things as I'm going along. I can go back three steps and come forward again because I have a better idea, see how they compare. Um, and I can save any one of them without having to name it. I can just increment it one more version number on the same photo number. So I can save a bunch of them during the interim, go back to anyone tomorrow, or send it to someone for different work. Uh, so that's the first thing I like to do, is get it squared off. And then I want to transform again and trim the image. That should have been the second. Now it's the first one in that list. And I think I'll make it 4 by 3. I've got a separate size I defined for netbook, because they didn't have 1024 by 600 ratio. Uh, it's there now. And uh, I'll lock it to the 4 by 3 ratio before I do anything else. And then I'll go move this out of the way somewhere, and it'll stay where I stash it until I wish I hadn't put it there. And now, let's see. We know we want her because she's cute. There she is. We know we want him because he's the other half of what it's about. And he's well-dressed. And okay, you've lost the tops of their heads. I'm going to go a little bigger. Now I'm going to grab it in the center instead of a corner and put it where I want it. And I think that's pretty close to perfect, and you might disagree, maybe right about there, okay? Good enough. And good enough for folk music? Done. There's the image, and that's much more powerful in terms of the actual message, the image for this photo. And uh, let's see what else we can do with it. Well, I think I'm pretty much done with what I want to do other than, oh, now we've got the whole image back. Uh, size down in the lower left, am I underway? I sure am. Uh, okay, we're running 2,400 pixels wide. We've still got the same 1.88 megabytes. We're still playing with the same material, and, uh, but it's wide. And while I'm still in uh, transform, Usually, I find it useful to resize now. Uh, if I want to do three different things with it, including making a poster, I won't resize now. But I'm going to just make it an 800 by 600 to mail to somebody. So I'll do that. Uh, width is already the hot number, and they'll say 800. And I'll hit tab. And because it's set to the 4 by 3 ratio, it automatically knows how to do the math. And I think that's all I want to do here, just to resize it. I'll say done. It's got a lot of pixels to short through, and should be done about now. And, and sure enough, it says it's done. There it is. And still playing with all the stuff, but it's now thinking of it for saving purposes as 800 by 600. And now I've transformed it all the way to the pixels I want to play with. So let's go into retouch and retouch those pixels. Brightness color is the first and most obvious thing to do with them. And this is sort of nice. I've got a curve up there that can be any curve you saved from yesterday or a year ago, or got from someone else because it's how their magazine likes to handle <coughs> their photos, or whatever. And, uh, or you can shape one and save it. And uh, you can increment in the increments that are built in with those buttons, or you can 
shift it to small steps and go in even smaller increments to hit one by one by one, or to just leave the button down and have it slowly increment across in real time. So let's try a little of that. I'll bring this out where I can s see it. And I uh, wish I had that wider screen with me tonight. And I could just pick up this curve and bend it. Darker areas are on the left of this line. Lighter areas are on the right of it. Doesn't matter where in the picture it is, it's the brightness we're talking about on this curve. And if I want to make the bright brighter but keep everything else about the same, I can ju just lift that button right up. And if this is bending down, I can build a new button there and flatten it out again. I can bring it up and down because there's one particular little spot I want to adjust and maybe it's the only thing that's in that brightness range. Or later I could go in and work in sections of the photograph that way. Very powerful. I don't want to do it. I'll reset it. And instead, I'd rather just lighten it. Plus, plus, plus is going to put a plus on the left, a plus in the middle, and a plus on the right on that curve. Lift the whole curve level. Minus will drop the whole curve. Brighter and darker. Uh, plus minus is going to keep the dark. Uh, dark goes up. Brightness goes down. What's that called? Lowering the contrast. The other one raises the contrast. Got it? That's what contrast is. Uh, or I can go fiddle with something in the middle, different from the things on the sides. I've got some other buttons for rough adjusting those. And you can play with all of them and go in and out, back and forth, very quickly and see what you're doing. I'm just going to make it a little brighter to start, like so. And I'm just tapping, and it's responsive. Um, and maybe that's br that might be a little too bright. And Or maybe I'll make it that bright and reduce the contrast a little bit and Maybe one step less bright. I'm not doing up there. Oh, same. Good. Okay. And um, and while we're at it, I'll play with color saturation. Next button down, and I'll add a little more color. They like to do this in magazines and stuff. Small increments, but it's changing. Can you see it? No. Uh, maybe not up there. Uh, I'll add a few extra ones. Maybe it'll show more. I think it's too exaggerated, but I did it, and you've got it. Uh, for the purpose of talking about it. And now I'm done with that tool. And by the way, we can look at what the change is. That's where it came from and that's where it got to. So very instant feedback. What do you want? Do you have it? And I used to have things that would show me. Pardon? The one step undo here undoes all seven steps you did in the dialog. When I'm in a tool, it will be one of these steps. I might have made 20 different adjusts on that color, right. but I'm going back to the beginning of that color right. tool. Okay? And I can come in again. And you can see how fast it is, so I can just do it again if it's something I want to do better. Um, and I can save it and compare <coughs> the ones I've saved in the gallery, just look at them against each other. There's all kinds of ways to uh, play it. it I, I just think this is so much more responsive than the other ones I bumped into in general. Uh, and I didn't go into complicated places to get to it. Uh, so that's almost all I want to do right now with retouch, but I have a secret weapon here and I can't resist. And by the way, let me look at some of gamma curves if you're working with fancy photographic processes. <coughs> you want to get some very accurate uh, results according to some curves that respond to maybe the photo cell you're using in your camera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Flattened brightness is a secret weapon that sometimes backfires and sometimes does not, but you go back a step and try something else. It is going to take the dynamic range of the brightnesses and it's going to boost it in a certain area of the brightness curve, amplify that section. Um, uh, what am I trying to think of? Uh, the standard uh, sound handling where they boost in certain sections. Uh, I'm thinking Doppler, and it's not what I mean. Come on, everybody Dolby. knows it. Hmm? Dolby? D Dolby, Dolby. Uh, you compress or expand a certain area within the dynamic gauge yeah. range to get good results. So this is doing that. It's spectacular sometimes and miserable other times, and it's free. You pop it in, pop it out, don't like it, don't use it. Brightness ramp. Uh, I'm using flash. 
and I'm taking a picture starting from this side down this row, and you're too bright and you're too dark. I can apply a horizontal brightness oh. ramp and correct. Nice. We live quick and change it until I like it. Uh, or I can do it vertical. Or I can do this much vertical and this much horizontal and do it that way. Uh, right? Isn't that what you want? Yeah. This guy's retired. He's doing what he wants and he's doing a good job with it. And if I've got a better idea, he says, great, thank you. And he does that too. Uh, so, um, other tricks like that, um, red eye you know all about. It's got good red eye correction. And uh, blur image, if you take your picture of your mother, and it's the nicest picture you ever took of her, but she doesn't like all those wrinkles, you can smooth it off a bit. It's OK, Hollywood actresses do that too. Uh, sharpen image is what I'm going for. Now I'm an optical physicist. And if there's one thing I know, you can't sharpen an image. I do it all the time these days. Simple. Uh, in fact, this just gave me three whole different tools for doing it to play with, see which one I like for the job. And in every one of them, I've got infinite adjustability for playing it my way. This is a treasure trove of sharpening technology at your fingertip. And I usually like the unsharp mask, so I'll go straight there. And I won't even bother to play with the parameters. The usual ones treat me pretty nice. I can hit it once or more than once, but every time I hit it, it got sharper. And uh, I did hit it, didn't yes, I? Yeah, you I did. did. Okay. And I saw it so I don't know if you can see this up there. Look at the guy's Harvard shirt. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say done. And now I'm going to say undo. That's sharpening. Can you see yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And you can also see it on the guy's oh, yeah. poster there. As well as on his poster. Thing. That's th That's with it. That's without it, OK? Yeah. Sharpening. If you sharpen too much, it looks ugly and blotchy. And the hair looks sharper, too. The hair looks sharper. A number of things are going to look sharper. This, look sharper. this is a super tool. I mean, this is a tool, because I understand it, it stuns me. The ones I don't understand, I just think are really nifty. But this one just stuns me, being this available at the fingertips, this quick and easy. Uh, so I like it. The other ones have it, too. I just find I work harder to use it in the others and to go back and forth until I like it the way I like it. So that photo should have a little more pop to it, as they say, than it did before. And for the hell of it, I'll say, let's save it. I don't have to, because that's all I wanted to do with it now to show you. But that's typically what I do with a photo. Uh, and uh, I'm going to save to same file, but as a new version. I won't lose what I've got. And I won't go away from where I'm working, but I've got to save the image of this step along the way, not just one I can go forward and back to in memory, but one that's now on the hard drive. In case I said, damn, I wish I could get back to that one. It was pretty good. Uh, and I'm really done with this one now, except that's where we came from. That's where we got to. Uh, it matters. It matters. This, this little camera just got a lot better because of this software. Uh, and that's the message here. Can you make a copy and work on the copy? Absolutely. It's the same, oh, okay, I see. same as the original, except for the detail of the settings in it, the pixels in it. It looks like same. you're working on the original picture. When From the beginning to where I did the save, I was on the original picture. I've now saved what was the last step at the moment, the last current step, right. as another picture. But I'm still on the original picture. Of, yeah, uh, up on the top, uh, 11 dash, it, it, the <coughs> new one will say all that dot v1 or v27, depending on what else I've been doing with that image, dot jpeg. So I'm still on the original one now. I haven't left it. I've just saved an advanced version so of it. The saved version didn't lose your history trail here. Right. The one I saved has one major defect over this one, I think. I better go back before I prove it to you. But I saved it as an 800 by 600. And I believe it won't have those extra pixels to play with later. The original still does. The one I saved does not. And that's the one you want to make. Yeah, exactly. I don't want it to have that extra depth for later. but. 
I may want it for something else next week. Got both. Uh, so uh, my, my general feeling about this program is my one about what I told you about fourth. Anything you want that the hardware can do is the target. And in this case, this guy's a damn good photographer, and he's a damn good programmer. And he's got all that free software routines, algorithms, discussion out there to work from. So he's going to make it do anything he wants it to do and add on what we want it to do if it fits his vision of what he wants it to do. I've had wonderful results with that partnership. Um, and, um, and I think he likes it even more than I do. I really think he loves the feedback to people that are as interested as he is. Can you save it in a format other than JPEG? Other yeah. than JPEG? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It yeah certainly it's got PNG right at your fingertips and a few other things. And, and you can grab it anyway and put it in anything you want. Wow. And you can add those Photoshop plugins to it to do anything it can't do. Mm -hmm. The sky's the limit. Uh, but the package is small. The nimbleness of it and the ease of finding what I'm looking for. I haven't gone far in that menu to do everything I've done, right? It's all very much in the least bit of it, if you will. And that's all I wanted to do with this one for now. And I just, I just tapped redo 10 times without counting. I just knew it was enough. It would stop when it got to the first one. And then I tapped uh, you know, undo or redo 10 times. Just whiz all the way back through from start to finish. Just give you a feel of what a change it made. Now, my point is, you've got a lot of good photos you took that you thought were the bad ones, <laughs> if, if you're not already doing this. And an awful lot of people I know, including me, knew how to do it, but it was too much of a pain in the neck to sit down and do it. If you go out and you take 100 photos, and if you don't, you're not going to come back with good ones. I learned that a long time ago. That's the best thing about digital cameras. You take 100 photos, and you've got them that afternoon. In fact, you've got them there before you leave, which is important at the library, for instance. Uh, and uh, um, you've got them, now you can convert them into what you wanted with ease and with a great amount of personal control without a lot of hassle. To me, that's what this tool ought to be about, and I like it because it's so close to the target already and keeps zero, keeps asymptotically approaching that perfect curve, that perfect line that it's curving into. Uh, we have half an hour and Okay, yeah, let's go on to some others. That is really all I would do for a normal photograph. Not more, and probably not less either. And it didn't take long. And I was going slow in explaining. Can we do a quick raffle of those? Pardon? Oh, can we do a quick raffle of those books? Oh, sure, sure. I'm sorry. Interrupt. Yeah. You want to do it, Jeremy? Yeah. Let's want to do it up here? Or? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Just to get rid of them before we forget. Um, John's got the spinner. Everybody got a ticket? Yeah, the first ticket is um, uh, 125. 125. That would be me. Okay, which one do you want? What you got? Droid, U2, and Galaxy Tab. <laughs> I need a little WD-40 on this. So I don't know why I took a copy for myself, but it could be. I think it's more how to use it. Next one. Next one is 127. 127. A winner. Okay. Next one. One, two, six. Come on. I'll posh. Pull it in. Okay. This just makes a difference. Makes it better. Of course, there's so few ticks in there, the numbers are going to close together anyway. One three three. That's better. Who's got one three three? 
Oh, that's one of the leftovers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they passed too. Oh, that's right, I never did take a ticket. Nope. Oh, that one just chose itself. One, two, four. That's me. Which do we? Let him pick. He's You're the one two. that reads. <laughs> okay, Jerry, how about you pick this next one? <laughs> One, three, four, I think that's a leftover. Uh, yep. One more try. There's one more leftover. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, zero. Tim. Okay. Okay. And remember, everyone's a winner on this drawing. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, she's cute too, and I like the sign. If you don't know what the lead is about, find out. Because I personally think that's the best answer to our capitalism versus communism problem. That's the only thing in the Bible, to my knowledge, that never got tried by anybody. Uh, people in charge don't like the idea. Uh, mm. But she got the idea. Uh, but I'm not going to work on it because I would work on this one exactly the same way I worked on the last one. It doesn't need more, it doesn't need less. Uh, it would make a nice photo. Cut in on her and her son. Uh, this one I already did. I told you everything's pretty swift, but there's an exception or two, and one of them is panorama. It can, in the most fascinating way you've ever seen, visually on screen while it's working, splice up to four horizontal or four <coughs> vertical images in a photo stitching operation. And it has red blotches where it's thinking, and you can watch it thinking and calculating and working while it goes and putting the pieces together. It's like watching a rapid jigsaw puzzle. But uh, it's not that fast anyway. And on this computer with this limited RAM uh, and not a very fast graphics chip, uh, this is one that shows. So I've done one here. This probably ran more than five, less than 10 minutes, not seconds, uh, to splice four. And of course, once you've got them spliced, you can keep splicing them up to four at a time either way. So you can keep going. As long as you get the memory. As long as you got the computer to hang it all together. Uh, and I find the computer is adequate. It's just costing me in time. That's the trade-off. So that's one I didn't want to demo here. I'm not lying about it. I just didn't want to take up the time. But I'll go into one I did with it. And uh, by the way, every time I tap in the picture, that's the center for where I expand it. And uh, I'll pick that knapsack, I guess it is down there. And it expands quite a ways. So it's holding a lot of pixels in here. It hasn't lost them. And now I can go walking around and looking at it. And by the way, I won't demo, demo tonight, but you can put in your own text. You can pick fonts. You can outline the font in different color of your choice. The outlining is very valuable on photos for the same reason the two-color grid line was valuable. Mm -hmm. It won't disappear on some different part of the background it gets to. And this has a very light, no, I don't even see it here. I guess I took it out. It had a light yellow outline, but I guess I took it out for this. No, once you set that, you can't go back and edit the text. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, you can. Uh, the text can be saved separately and brought up again. Once, once you save the final, the final is a conglomerate of all of it. But you can save the step before it, bring it back up again. And I would. If I were. For instance, I've made a front screen for the uh, free Linux computer we set up at the Natick Senior Center as part of our project there. And the front screen is talking about Linux. Come up, give it a try. It's running Ubuntu 10.04. Well, I'm about to go back and say it's running Ubuntu 10.04. 11.04, 11. 11.10. 11 uh, so I've got to make a change. No problem. I saved the image. I'm just going to put the new slightly edited line across it. You can tilt it. You can change its size, move it around. You can play with it till you're happy. When you save it, you have locked the combination as that thing that you saved. But you still have the earlier ones. You could have saved it anywhere along the way. Can you set the um, type of paper it's going to print on? in 
Botox as you can in. Uh, I mean, printing with different, uh, yeah, different brightnesses and such yeah. to match the paper. I'm not aware of it in Photox. You can, of course, take the image and print it in anything else that can do that. Oh, okay. So I don't think there's any need for it in Photox. It'll just make it bigger, I think. Most right, people. The particular type of paper that you want to print on for a different reason. If you want to adjust. It's, it's building the image. Once you've got the image, you've got an image you can print with anything you want to print with. It does know how to print, but I don't think it's that flexible. The However, a professional way to match it to the output medium is the gamma curve. In, in yeah, print. which it does have. So that if, if you wanted to save a color corrected for a particular medium to date, right, right. you'd use the gamma curves. If you were in one shop working with one kind of printer. The other tool yeah. that knows how to do the right thing for this printer and this paper would be the exactly. yes. with one With one relationship between you and the printer, maybe the company you're working for or whatever, uh, a gamma curve would be the answer and it has that. Okay. But if you want to fiddle and adjust and yeah. see what so you want. The printer, it probably has that curve matching built into the uh, photo printer's right. proprietary driver. And then any program you use is just in the printer controller. Why don't I go on a little further? And there's um, also a because program called Printox that comes with it. Yeah, he, he's got a lot of other programs, and one is yeah. called Printox OXX. And I think he probably anticipated your question. I am not familiar with Printox, and look through that whole set of his programs, you'll find other interesting things. Uh, but uh, this is the only one of them I've leaned on heavily. And it's, it's, I call computers inner space, exploring, it's infinite, you just keep going in. And this compartment of inner space has kept me locked in it fairly happily for not having to expand further for me. Uh, but I'll also say I'm probably really good at about 20% of its tools. And I'm demonstrating tonight probably 5% of its tools. So don't think I'm giving you the whole pitch. Uh, and you can also swing right off into a whole different tool for, for finishing a job if that's what you want. Mm -hmm. It's the responsiveness of it and the ease of getting to that responsiveness that I want. Like. And the price, of course. Can the average person um, approach uh, him, whoever, um, make suggestions? Does he have a website? He has a, he has a uh, formal way to put in a comment mm -hmm. and an email address to put in a comment. Where, uh, where he downloaded is his website. Okay. Uh, he, has, he has the help that I showed you a little bit of, that, that overview. Mm -hmm. He has it. A built-in help guide in the program that's excellent, and it starts with little lines for each function, and then the word more at the end of each line, and you click and you get a paragraph or ten paragraphs and three illustrations or whatever it takes for each one of them. Uh, and then it expands further into a big online user guide if you want that. Uh, they're all written in good English, not a given on all these programs, <laughs> and in intelligent English. I like the way it goes from easy more intense, smoothly, without your having to read the big thing to get the little clue. Uh, I like it for that. Uh, and like I said, I'm picky. I'm looking for people pickier than I am and looking for something I want to feed them rather than something I want to be pushing uphill. My philosophy is I'm going to make better money by having a happy client recommend me to two others than by making him come back over and over for things he shouldn't have had to come back for. Right. Uh, so I like this. This paves my way and his way at the same time. Uh, here's an interesting one. I've already processed this one. I brought it up from a, a little bit and kind of dark and I, I boosted it to where it's what I call a nice candid photograph of the sign. That's a sign I like. You get zoomed in sometimes. How did I do that? Out that way, I suppose. Oh, I know how. Oh, by the way, every time I tap, it gets bigger. That's what I did wrong. And if I left, I tapped on the touchpad for that. If I left click on the mouse, it, it'll uh, do the same thing. Incrementally get bigger. But if I right click the mouse, it goes all the way back in one step. Golden, cool. Gold, really good for everything I do with photos. So uh, you, when I first thought about it, I said, is, is that a good thing? 
hell yes. And now that I've been using much better than the other way where I'm fishing for where I want to be. Uh, I'm going to do something fancier here. And I mentioned there's something extra good about this camera, but I'll tell you later. The extra good thing about some Casio cameras, and I was just over at Micro Center on the way here today, looking at what they had. And the new Casio that they have has a great price and some nice features, but not the secret weapon this one has. In the best shots, which is what Casio calls those extra setup routines in the camera, it has two. One for looking at maybe a poster up on a billboard, and one for looking at maybe a business card down at the table, or at the library, a photograph or a picture of a page that you want to record while you're at the library. Instead of putting your 15 now, cents in if the I want to take machine. a good picture of that square on, I want good lighting, so I'll put on the flash. I want it sharp, I don't want my hand motion. I could set up a tripod and fancy lights and a, a semi-reflecting glass and get side 45 angle lighting on the paper and it won't bounce back into the lens because it's coming in at 45 from two different sides. I could do that. Or I could take the flash and go straight down and see the flash right in the center of the page, right back into the camera. Or I could take the picture from over here and then I'd have what I've got here. It's kind of oblique, isn't it? It's a rectangle, but it's a rectangle that needs parallax correction to get back to looking like a rectangle. That's built into this camera. I can set it in that best shot mode. Take the picture. It shows me a few, maybe three, black borders on the picture, overlaid on the picture. And one of those black borders is red instead of black. If I like it, I just press the button. If I don't like it, I hit the right arrow and try the next of the three choices it made. If one of them aligns with the border of the page, I take it and right in the camera, it squares it off for me, and it's good. Well, they I want to get a new that? camera about now. I think it's about time. Well, this one's still got resale value, but it's a good camera. I couldn't find one in the same price range that was as good on that feature that I value. So I said, Mike, and by the way, his name is Mike Cortellison. Cornellison. Cornellison, Cornellison, and uh, Mike Corn is often the way he just signs off. And uh, he's great. So I said, Mike, I want to go shopping for a camera. And for some reason, they dropped the best feature I've ever seen in a little camera that's other than the standard ones. I said, how'd you like to put it back? And that just hit. It's, uh, it's working not quite right in the October release that you'll get today for download. It's not bad, but if you run it two or three times, you'll get really much better than one round. It's been corrected. We found the bug and fixed it. So I've got a corrected version here, and you'll have it in a couple weeks. And uh, um, I'll go use it. This is a transform also. We're taking the shape and transforming it. But, so transform. and. He calls it straighten the image. Now, straighten to me is kind of what I do with rotate. I don't like straighten. I thought about it for a while and I said, I think I like square. No, it doesn't, it makes it a rectangle, not a square. But it's what I do with a carpenter's square. Uh, so I thought square was pretty good. We both agreed that the perfect word would be rectify. If it didn't mean something else, then it's totally different. Mm -hmm. But we haven't found a good word for it. So right now, it's sitting here as straight. Well, in drafting, they talk about right angles, angles to each other, the orthogonal. I need a word. Orthogonal sounds pretty hefty to me. We want this to be easy. So <laughs> if anyone here, before I leave tonight or later, has a better word, give it to me. I want it bad. And the point is, we can slip it in that easy when we have it. But it wants to be in the manual and everything. I don't want to just do it a one on. I want it to be the way everything gets right. So we agree we're not quite there yet on the word. And that can be as important as the technology in places, because we want it to be available to everyone. But let's go play with it. This one, I don't really do anything in the box. I'm running it off my mouse, which is my touchpad in this case. And it says, click the four corners of a tetragon area, press apply. The image is warped to make the tetragon into a rectangle. Whoopee. So let's get that off one of the corners to start. And I got to guess at some of these corners, they might not be exactly where the corner is, where I want it. Might be a little folded corner, too. So I'm going to say that's the corner nominally. I'm going to say that's the corner. We could expand this and do it from that level for more accuracy. And this corner, I think, is going to be way down here. See where I'm going? Because of that bend. 
and this corner I'm going to argue is right about in there. If you disagree with me, why well, get your free copy and bend it your way. <laughs> but this is the demo, and that's it. How long will it take to do the correction? We're working on 600 by 800, but we're actually working on... Yeah, six. Oh, only that. See, it's now 0.18 megabyte. It's much smaller than before. So this is a small version we're playing with. And how long will it take? One, two, three, go. That's how long it took. It was just as close to instant as you could get. It wasn't a second. And it's squared off. So maybe I'm ready to go shopping for a camera. New feature. Uh, still looking for a name. Well, it's got a working one in the meantime. Um, so that's what I wanted that one for. That and nothing but. And what else have we got here? Oh, good. This one's got trouble. This is a really neat, but it's one of my favorite street intersections in Boston. Everyone know where it is? Congress. Yeah. It's kind of a little east yeah. across the channel from the post office yeah. near South Station. Metro um, used to be headquartered there years ago. Metro, New England Convection Center. Oh! On the right hand side. Uh, well, this. This is two kinds of puzzle. Look close and you'll see that obviously it's leaning a lot in to go toward the top on the left, but it's also leaning in toward the top on the right. We're getting parallax exaggeration because the camera doesn't have a lens I can lift like a full <coughs> studio camera. And it's also, I think, tilted because in the middle it looks kind of slanted too. It isn't straight up and down in the middle either. Where do you begin on a problem like this? Well, I'll begin with the one I haven't showed you yet, I guess. So we'll go look at uh, the parallax correction first. Again, it's a transform, right? You knew that. And we've got a whole bunch of these. Uh, remember I played the straighten image, the last one? And that turned a rectangle back into a rectangle. Uh, unbend image is the one I'm going to use for this, but we've got four different styles of warp image to play with. Remember, we had a lot of sharpening tools. We have a lot of warping and unwarping tools also, and they're powerful for different problems. Uh, but for this one, I've learned to use the unbend image. It's not the only one that will work uh, when I've come to use. I want a grid again. I need a grid for this work. And for my first job, I want to get the bend on the, I want to get the tilt here equivalent to the tilt over here. Uh, they'll both be bending the same as the middle when I'm done. So this will be less of a bend. This will be the same. And this will have some bend the other way from the way it's bending now. So they all have the same slant. That's my assignment for this first step. <laughs> and to do that, um, that's vertical, right? Wrong. You use the horizontal tool to correct for it. Uh, it makes sense after you worry about it long enough. And this takes quite a while, so instead of hitting it one by one, which you could see if you wait long enough, I'm just going to let it go and roll for a while. And stop <laughs> it much too long. We'll come back the other way a little bit. That's worse than before. You want it's minus. minus. You want minus. Yeah, I know. I was, going, I was correcting for the other one. And now I'm closer to where I want to be. It's still the left side <coughs> is still aiming to the right, but not much. The right side has started aiming to the right. I almost don't care about the middle, so I'll move the box there. Is the left leaning the same amount as the right is leaning? That's your question for this step. No, not quite. Not quite. What would you like to do? Would you like it to, the top to open more or close more? Open more. Open more? Okay, I'll move the horizontal up a little bit. About that much or more? A little bit more. Give it five at a time. Whoa. That's too much. It's too vertical yeah. on the left and far too far to the right on the other side. you should have straightened it first. So that was, I'll give it three bobs. So why don't you stop rotating the whole I, Well, I could have tried straightening it first, but I want to do it this way. It doesn't matter which one you do. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to say that's correct. Fins, time out. Does Fins work in Boston? I'm from New York City. Um, so um, I'll say done for this operation. And it's taking a little while. Busy at the bottom, see? And uh, there it is. Working harder on this good job. And now I've got that, and I'm going to rotate it. That's a transform too. To rotate. 
And, and by the way, that grid will now be staying with that tool until I go away or take it away. And uh, I can take it back by hand. Let's take it back by a degree and see what I get. Long Wrong direction. Way. One more. Pretty close to right. That's nice. Can we say I'm done for tonight? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if Trim will work now, because Trim, if you remember, is juggling two operations, not just his own operation. I can afford to ask, because I can go backward. I'll say Trim. Didn't it didn't finish the job, but it didn't hurt either. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. I'll say done. I'll go on to transform Trim. And now most of the small programs totally die at this level. They can't do this sort of correction. Uh, the big ones can. And some of them do it very elegantly. Some of them do it with a lot of grief attached. But I think I want to go all the way to the top here if I can. So I hit a black wedge in some corner that I don't want. Well, I might want to frame this differently, but for the moment, that looks good. I'll stop about there. I don't think I want to go all the way to the bottom. Oh, I forgot to set the 4x3, but trust me, you can do that. And uh, I'll say done. And there's my corrected photograph. It was easy. It did take a little more time than the other operations up till here, but you don't do it that often. And uh, I, I won't bother to size it correctly and brighten it, because uh, yes, I will, I'll brighten it, and I'll show you why in a minute, because I'll go on and do some artists. So I'm not ready now to retouch those pixels that I want. Brighten this color, and I'll just punch, I'll brighten it a little bit, and maybe increase the contrast one top and bring up color saturation a couple of taps. Uh, whoops, a couple of taps, about like so. And while we're at it, a little sharpening couldn't hurt. Let's retouch and sharpen. And I'll do my usual favorite sharpen on sharp mass. One tap is usually enough to do a good job. Now I think the sign's got a little sharper. And I'll say done, and we'll go back and see if that's true. Go back one step. Go forward again. It's pretty hard to see there on uh, this, this projector. I, I don't think it did much. It didn't hurt either. I'll go back all the way. And so this picture got some better in the process. And that's what I call a good photo processing round for this one. Again, much faster if I'm doing it without explaining at the same time. Um, and now I'm going to do a different trick now that I've got this. I did it on purpose so I could do this. Uh, it's a secret on this particular fight between the projection screen and my display. But I'm going to go one to the right from there to the art options. And I'm going to look at draw. I think I'm going to do that. I think you have to do a down arrow. Yeah, that's going to work. I got to, I'll go to color depth first to show you what it is. And uh, if I have a color depth of one, I'm down to the minimum three colors that we're mixing to do all the artwork here. Uh, and if I have 16, <coughs> I'm mixing a lot of color shades, and I can get to what you see here. So I'll go into color depth. And it's at 16, and I'll grossly minimize it. And that's what we get from the primary colors. With just a depth of two, we get a lot more. That's a very simple way to posterize. Isn't it? You got it. This is posterization, and it's not the only trick I have for it. So you've got one idea there. I'll cancel it. That's where I came in from. And instead, right? Oh, <laughs> wait a minute. It, very nice. This got fixed within the last month also. I said, I don't like the prompt at this place because if you don't know what you're expecting, it ain't going to tell you either. And you're going to sit there nervous. Do I go forward? Do I go backward? Mm -hmm. How do I interpret it? It's crystal clear now. We had a discussion on it. And this one, if you stop to read it, you'll know whether you want to go forward or go back. And I don't have to keep them. I can continue. So. 
Uh, that's not what I wanted, though, is it? No, you wanted the other one. Damn it. Okay. Um, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, I'm going to keep it right this way for this purpose. I'm just playing with the artifact, so I don't have to correct it for that. And I'm going to give you some different things to look at, too. Uh, what I wanted to do was go into a next option, which is drawing. And in drawing, oh, drawing, there it is. I can, I'll keep that where you can read it. It's all showing on the screen, yep. Uh, I set these about halfway to start. A lot of adjustability on this and instant feedback. You know what you're doing. And with both of those halfway in, watch what happens. Come on. Look at the mess. Oh, there it goes. There we go. Mm -hmm. Come on. My uh, pad is moving this way. That's the idea. Anyway, very adjustable. And anytime you want, you can use a, a scratch pad instead or a chalk. That easy. And uh, I wanted to show you those tools. And in addition to those tools, um, into the touch to that the makes right. an image go well in the PNG file. Yes. Building on that concept, this one came a little later. It's months old now, but not years old. And um, again, you can play with a lot on this one. You see, on the line no, this should have nice right. bright colors, and I don't see the bright colors. But, but you can also bring up, see the image coming up in the background? I can bring more or less of the actual image or just go with the outlines. I can, this is probably a bad picture for this example because I'm not getting a whole lot of color showing. These lines should be neon colored lines. I just picked the wrong example. Fair enough, let's go find a different example. And um, the forward of the boat. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, and uh, we'll play with that some. Now we're getting into art. Now we've we've got it to the picture we want. We've brought the pixels up in brightness and contrast and special adjustments to what we want to see them best. Now we want to artsify it, and we've got a lot of tools for that too. This is fun for most people, not not reporting type stuff. Uh, but you'll see it in an awful lot of the brochures you get these days. This is how they're doing them. Uh, embossing, you know, about looks raised. Uh, tiles, little mosaics or big ones, it's basically losing the uh, pixel size, building it big. Dots, this is rotogravure. This is brighter means a bigger dot with a black background between the dots. And darker means smaller dots with black background between them. Uh, and you can make those dots very big and get an Andy Warhol effect, if you wish. Uh, whoops, come back. It's too far. Uh, this is the one. Well, let me get the picture good first, because this will be better with a good picture. So on this one, I'm not going to say much this time, because you know how to play the game. Oh, I'll say one thing though, this is for photographers of any kind with any tool. <coughs> I want to make it, make it vertical or horizontal. What in this picture is vertical or horizontal? The water. No, <laughs> the float. The dock. The dock. The corner the of Water dock. is horizontal. Yes. The reflection in the water compared to the original will be vertical. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because yes. of that. I'm going for the bow of the boat and its reflection. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Dynamite. Very good. It's close, you see. It's not far off. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to sneak up on it. It's too sneaky. There we go. And I'm just looking at that white wedge on the far side of the bow, in the water and above. One more. I gave it two. Yeah. I think you were right. That one, and I'm going to say done. Oh, I'm going to say trim. Remember the black wedge edges? Yeah. Does, does That's trim. Do you have an offset control there to let you adjust the grid? 
to the left? Uh, yes and no. Uh, the way it's set up right now, no. I can change the spacing of the grid. I can change the offset. I can change. I was going to say I can change the line size. I think I can't change the line size anymore. We didn't need it once we made that fix. What will be useful is there's a little thumbdial there that you can switch it over. To nice. Align it with the bow. You're making trouble. He'll like that. Trim. Trim. Oh, trim. Well, it didn't matter because I'm going to trim way down from it anyway, but I forgot to hit the trim button, which would have taken out to the maximum size to those black wedges. Doesn't matter, and I whacked it one extra time. Go back where you came from. There you are. And uh, down to trim image. Uh, I'll set it for four to three again. I'll remember to whack it this time and lock the ratio when I hit it. And now, get this out of the way for the time being somewhere. And I want to pull it down to mostly the boat and its reflection, I would say. That bow boat behind has a nice, almost straight curve to it. Anyone know this kind of boat? It's not your average Boston rowing boat, is it? Dory? Well, it looks a hell of a lot like a Viking longboat to me. I'm going to go for that. So I named it Viking short boat in my slide. <laughs> and then I emailed my, I mailed a picture of it to my Norwegian friends. Now I've been in a week of intensive discussion on early Norwegian classic <laughs> boat design. <laughs> it turns out one of my good friends uh, in his younger years uh, sailed one from Norway to England. He put a centerboard under it, which they normally don't get. They did his sailing rigs, and they even have a topsail above the mainsail, square rigged on one mast. Very weird. And apparently they hit Northern Europe in about the year 500 and got this design by the year 1500. So I asked a question and got a lot. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think that's all I want to do for here. So I'll say done. There's my picture. It looks more squared off now. The dock does not look squared off. Uh, the end of the dock might look squared off, uh, but most of the dock does not. It's in fact tilted with the, the, whole angle, the whole angle of the shot. Yeah. So this is the picture I wanted. Now I'm going to brighten it quick. Uh, whoops, retouch, of course. And uh, why don't I sharpen? Sharpen's over here, too. Um, I'll, I'll go for the usual brightening, just enough so it shows like mad. Maybe about there. And I might drop the contrast if it looks pretty sunny. I'm not sure and bright, so I'll go down and look. That works. I can see inside it. I can see all the pieces. And I'll put in a little color saturation, and just enough so we can go play with. Uh, come back, come back, wherever you were. Done. And now that's where art stuff. Oh, I should I should uh, sharpen it. You should be a fool not to. Almost all the time. And it says busy, and it says done. And now uh, this is done. Now I'm going to go play with art. Can't get there directly on this screen tonight, so I'm going to go to painting. And again, I have a lot of parameters I can play with for different effects. But I'm going to stay with the default ones for now. And I'll just apply. Watch the time. One, two, three, go. Done. I've got a watercolor. Nice. Or I can go for the one that you get in that brochure this year. The real estate brochure is really like this, I notice and uh, say apply that. I've now marked the borders between the colors on this very reduced palette of colors. Apply. And it's about done now, I'd say. No, now it's done. What do you think? Kind of different than the photograph. Kind of artsy-fartsy. And one of a zillion combinations in there and I think that's about all I wanted to show you. I gave you a hell of a lot of tools and a hell of a lot of ways to use the tools. And I can spend long in any one of the tools. I've got a couple of tools that will take longer and they're powerful. And 
if you if you allow, I'll hit them quickly, but it's later than I wanted to go. Can I just mention a few tools? Can you sure. Can I tell them? Okay. Uh, first of all, you now know you can make something sharper, even if it's not sharper. Although I know that's impossible. I now know how well you can fake it with many ways. But there's one way you can make things sharper without having them sharper that's real as opposed to digital uh, digitally fiddling with things to make it look sharp. <laughs> and uh, do you know they can take pictures from space and read a license plate number? Do you know that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Electro optical. It's been physics. a while. They could do that 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, they can do much better now. How do you do it? The atmosphere is changing density all the way through. It's wavering. It's shimmering. How the hell can you do that? You can't with one image. But if you can blend multiple images, you can average it out, can't you? Yeah. How many does it take? It turns out that three helps, and 10 is almost always enough to do magic. Mm -hmm. Same with signal processing with electronics. Yeah. 10 is a magic golden number for getting most of the way to perfect cheap. And uh, so that's how you do it. So this can take up to nine snapshots of the same, sna put your camera on a tripod and just take the same picture. You're in dim light and you're trying to get a photo. Just take nine of them and average them out. It does it. And is sharper. It really took out the noise from the picture. This program will do that. Yeah, this can do that. Uh, suppose, end of that tool. You can go play with it once you've got the, uh, and you can read about it too. Uh, suppose you're taking a picture, he's got a wonderful example online, in a cathedral. It's kind of uh, fairly well lit around the seats down low in the floor, down low in the cathedral. It's dark as you get up high. And then you get up to these wonderful clerestory windows, way up high with sunlight streaming through them, and it's much too bright. It's washed out totally in that photo. It takes three different exposures of the same scene. And his ITGO and optimize the dynamic range for whichever one of the three has the best dynamic range for that portion of the area in the picture. And it stitches them together, and it comes out uniformly illuminated like magic. The panorama I showed you, by the way, isn't just juggling. It's also correcting for curvature and uh, correcting for exposure across what are going to be four different exposed images as you're swinging around in sunlight. Uh, it does that all automatically. And uh, a last one of that kind of trick, which is cheating by patching together multiple ones to get it right. Automatically, uh, you're taking a picture which has Jill in the foreground, Jerry a lot further back than Jill, and you guys totally out of focus if I can see Jill, or vice versa especially if I don't have a lot of good lighting in the room. In bright light, I might get away with it by stopping it down to where everything's sharp. So, what do you do? You take three different focused pictures on that tripod, holding it tight, or holding close enough so it can juggle them back for you, which it can within reason, and it patches the distances in and focuses it all the way through. All in this little package, but not as quick as the ones I was showing you. And not the ones you'd be doing most of the time either. But when you want the tool, you've got it. Those were a few of its tricks. I haven't told you how it removes dust. I haven't told you how you can have a power line running through the middle of the scenic view and keep all the scenery and lose the power line. Or for my genealogy work, of an, an old photo that got ripped and you can take out the rip. I haven't told you how, on that first picture I showed you, Jill, me, a license plate, and uh, the uh, business card laid into it. Uh, how I had it automatically slice out the business card easily and automatically and put it in as a copy I could bring across to the other image without using layers uh, and still do all that work. Um, he's got wonderful illustrations on the site. Just, just type in Photox and go look down the page at some of the examples. And the one I particularly like, I'm guessing it's his mother, but I'm not sure, 
and uh, this wonderful, what looks like a mountain reservoir with, in the foreground, you can see a little sprig of grass and you know he must be standing on a dike or a dam or something like that, taking the photo. And it's got a giant whirlpool going straight down in the foreground, which might be a water intake, but it wouldn't be for what I'd do because we're bringing the floating stuff, I'd put it underwater. But it might be an older one that actually takes it in. And the water's just rushing down into a hole in the lake. And there's this woman standing right on the brink of the hole, standing on the water and kind of looking at the whole thing. Just as easy as my business card. You can do artsy things that way, too. So that's Photox. It's the only tool I picked to show you tonight because it's one where we give back and we get back. It's, it's an ultimate FOSS trip for us. And it's a tool you can take home and play with now from the meeting. And I think most of you will find good things you and friends can do with it. And as you know, it's free, and it's free for sharing, which is what it's all about. That's the end of everything up to part three, which is anything you want. Question. Thank you. Okay, thanks.